Welcome back to ESC 315. This is Lecture 3, Project Management. And I'll just say a couple of notes about this before I get into the lecture. So the lecture was recorded last year. I've edited the audio a little bit just to make it a little bit more clear. The major difference is that I've moved this up in the schedule because it is such an important topic for the project managers in each group to be able to manage your work throughout the term. So I've moved this up and I do refer to some topics as having been discussed already, but don't worry, we'll be going over those in detail. Two of the things that I do mention throughout this presentation are work breakdown structures and Gantt charts. And also keep in mind with these, we'll be going over these in labs and I'll be showing you exactly how to build them. So don't worry about um, any of the how-to type information. Just pay attention to sort of the level of information such as what are these, how can they help us, how do we use them, what, did, what do they show. But in terms of actually building them, we'll do that in the lab in Microsoft Project. So for the project managers in each group, this will be a very important topic. It will help you actually get through the work you need to do throughout the semester. For everybody else, this is sort of knowledge that you'll need to know in order to pass the test. But in my opinion, much more importantly, in order to go out into the workforce and be a project manager, not just on an environmental impact assessment, but as I mentioned, there are lots of other types of work where project management is important. And in fact, there are lots of people who spend their entire careers specializing in project management, helping scientists get their jobs done efficiently and in, in a coordinated way. So it's actually quite a, a, a large career path for some people. And it's more of an engineering type work stream. You'll see that um, if you look at the textbooks or a lot of the literature of project management, it's really based on engineering. But a lot of the work that we do as a multidisciplinary team in an environmental impact assessment or some other scientific endeavor, we'll have a lot of crossover with different disciplines, including engineers. So we'll go over work breakdown structures and Gantt charts in the next couple of weeks in labs. I think everything else in here is about as detailed as we need to get for project management for this semester. So I hope you enjoy it and learn something and keep in mind that this, again, is something that will be useful to your career beyond environmental impact assessment. Okay, thanks. So scope, really, what what is it you need to do? The scope lays out sort of the instructions of how you're going to do things to communicate with either a client or government or the public. But it basically says, what is it we're going to do? What are we going to produce at the end of this? Schedule is fairly obvious. When are we going to do things? Budgeting, also fairly obvious. How much is it going to cost? Budgeting usually comes down to two things, labor and expenses. And expenses in environmental science can be broken down into travel, analytical costs, uh, field equipment. Analytical cost is usually the highest. If you're sending samples off to a lab, it can run into the millions of dollars pretty quickly, especially if you're doing organic chemistry, that's really expensive. Um, and then quality, so I'll talk about the difference between quality assurance and quality control. Um, and that really comes mm -hmm. down to documenting. It's really all about checklists. Have you done this? Have you done this? Have you done this? There's long lists of checklists of things that you need to do to keep quality control and quality assurance high. And then communication, which is part of project management. Different teams will have different methods for communicating, both internally within the team and then externally with clients, stakeholders, government, everybody else. And then tracking, which is really important as a project manager, you wanna track things as you go. And so you wanna track time, budget, all of the things that we just talked about, you wanna track all that stuff. So there's some jargon I'll be using. This is pretty common stuff in project management. So a deliverable is really anything that you're gonna produce and send, usually as, as proof of your work or to kind of communicate the work that you've done. It can be a report, usually a report, it can be a digital file of data, a drawing, presentation, opinion, whatever. That's your deliverable. That needs to be laid out in terms of what exactly am I gonna deliver when I'm done this project. A resource is simply a person who's willing to work on your project. If you have used MS Project so far, you've probably seen that you need to specify resources and there's a lot of resource tracking in there in terms of availability, uh, but resource is really just a person. Um, a milestone is a point of completion. 
somewhere along your project, you're going to have a groups of tasks. When that group of tasks is completed, that's a milestone. It allows you to move on to the next stage. And then critical path. I'll go over these again when I show a Gantt chart because it's a little easier, but just so you know what I'm talking about. Critical path is a series of tasks that are time limiting. So if you've got five different activities going on, only one of those typically will be limiting in terms of the overall timeline. And the other ones uh, have slack, which is the definition at the bottom. So slack is some spare time that you're able to, um, to compress or take advantage of to change your schedule. But basically the critical path is the one, if you can trace all of the tasks that from start to finish that are completely sequential with no, uh, no slack in between, that's your critical path. And slack is part of all the other tasks that are going on. Okay, so I, I mentioned a non-EIA example. Uh, so COSIWIC, how many people have heard of COSIWIC? Any probably biologists? So this is essentially the committee that gets together and um, assigns a level of threat to any endangered species in Canada. And this feeds into the Species at Risk Act. And I happen to be looking this up for my other course that I'm teaching, the intro course. And it occurred to me that there are a lot of different teams of scientists working on this uh, from different organizations all across Canada, from universities, government, um, consultants, you name it. And they're all sort of binned into their technical discipline, very specific technical disciplines. Um, and it occurred to me that this is one area where a project manager would be very essential to keep all of these scientists kind of on track. Because there's one thing that you can guarantee is if you have a whole bunch of different scientists working on stuff, if they're not tightly managed, everybody's going to sort of go off on their own tangent and do their own thing and uh, you're not going to end up with a nicely aligned project. And so COSIWIC uh, and the reports that they produce kind of struck me as something that seems to be very well managed. They're sort of tightly constrained into what they need to come up with in the end. And from all the reports that I read, um, they had done so. So I thought I'd just throw that out there as another example of kind of a non-EIA setting where project management would be crucial. Okay, so let's get into the different elements of project management, starting with scope. So what will be done and how? Uh, it's really just that simple. Usually you start with a proposal. Um, if you're doing an EIA, you're doing an EIA on behalf of some project. Although not necessarily, there are some EIAs that are done, say, by government, and sometimes they're done after the fact. But typically, I would say the vast majority of EIAs are done on behalf of some proponent who wants to develop some project, wants to get approved. And so they will send out what's called an RFP or a request for a proposal. You don't have to remember that, but just for your own information, they'll send an RFP to a bunch of consultants. The consultants then each will complete a proposal. The proposal can be anywhere from 10 pages to like a thousand pages. Some of them are really massive documents because an EIA is usually somewhere between a million and fifty million dollars. They really vary but for you know some of the bigger ones that I've worked on which tend to be around the thirty million dollar mark you invest a lot of time and effort to first win the job but in addition to just having to put together a proposal that the client will like the more important part is you're gonna spend a lot of time pre-planning your project making sure that you've actually got the resources, making sure that you've got a plan in place that can actually get the job done before you commit to doing it. Because if you haven't thought all this through, you send out a proposal, the client accepts it, and lo and behold, your, your, your bid came in at 50% uh, cheaper than everybody else's, and the reason it came in cheaper is because you totally forgot a bunch of stuff, and now you've got a contract that says you need to get it done, but you're doing it for half the price and you're gonna lose a lot of money. So that's obviously really bad. So even though most people hate doing proposals, they are very valuable in terms of settling on an approach and making sure that you can actually do it and making sure that your whole team is sort of comfortable with the approach you're planning to take. Uh, a, a really important part of any proposal is laying out assumptions and limitations. Uh, because any, any proposal is going to have a lot of assumptions. Uh, 
For example, we assume the client will provide this data set in this format, and so because like data, data processing can be a major part of an EIA, you want to be very specific about what you're assuming in terms of what you'll receive, who's got what information, when you'll receive it. Uh, the assumptions are probably the most important part of, of a proposal. Uh, as well, the limitations. Limitations basically say what you're not going to do. Um, we are not going to uh, assess everything under the sun, as, as we talked about uh, when we were talking about sort of EIA scoping. So you want to be very clear about what's not included. Uh, otherwise, uh, you get what's called scope creep. And scope creep is when you've got uh, scope laid out, and this is this is generic to all project management, not just EIAs. But scope scope creep is you've got a scope document. It says you will do A, B, C, D, and E, and the client says, "Oh, but you know this task is you know that should be included in scope E. It's really similar. Can you just do that as well? It's it's not really much more work." And you go, "Well, I want to be a good consultant. I want to get more work. Sure, I'll do it." Then they come back the week later and ask for something. Again, just a tiny bit outside of scope, but um, sooner or later that scope creeps and gets larger and larger until it's a big beast that you've agreed to do a whole bunch of extra work that you're not getting paid for. So the work plan is similar to a proposal. A work plan is usually more detailed though, and a work plan can be part of a proposal or it can be sort of something you do internally. And I highly recommend doing work plans even if you're, you know, no matter what field you're working in just as an internal sort of check for yourself that everything makes sense. Because once you actually start sitting down and writing out your plan, you'll find lots of things that you probably wouldn't have thought of otherwise until it's too late. Uh, so even little things like, um, you know, who's going to convert the existing spreadsheets into our database format, little things like that. You want to have all that laid out in a work plan, who's doing what, when it'll be done, um, and it'll just make your project run a lot more smoothly. And then work breakdown structure, we talked about that before. Everybody's done one now, or every group has done one. Those are often put into a proposal just to kind of show other people sort of how everything fits together. And I'm just gonna take a quick look at my infographic. Oh yeah, so justification, that's sometimes necessary, usually not. Usually the justification comes from the RFP that the client has issued. Business objectives, are something you want to consider. Are you meeting business objectives? But again, it doesn't necessarily need to be in your scope. It's more sort of something to help you think about the way you're going to do things. Um, projects exclusions, that's the same as limitations. And then constraints, that's pretty similar to your limitations and assumptions. Okay, so in addition to just saying how you're going to do things, uh, you also want to specify your deliverables. The most common deliverable is a tech memo or a technical report. The difference between those is somewhat arbitrary. Usually technical memos are shorter, they don't have a table of contents, and they're just really one factual sort of thing that you might investigate. So uh, you were talking about soil sampling. Uh, if you go out and sample soil, you might sample 30 plots, send all the soil to a lab, get the data back, and then put all that into a table with some type of interpretation about what the soil looks like. That would be a perfect sort of level of information for a technical memo. Just sort of one sort of well-focused type of technical endeavor, whether it's field sampling or some other type of analysis. And then a report usually is much larger it would include multiple components kind of contributing to one. And again, to use our Site C example, all of our appendices that we're looking at, those are tech memos. The report itself is usually like volume one, volume two, which relies on all those tech memos to sort of feed information into it. And then presentations. Presentations are really important uh, because not everybody will read a report, but lots of people will sit through a presentation as long as it's relatively short. And you can communicate, I think, a lot more clearly in a presentation because also people have the opportunity to ask you questions. And then data files, this is less common, but there's lots of considerations that go along with sending data files. 
most of the time when a scientist puts together a data file, it's not really intended for external consumption. There's not a lot of documentation that goes along with it. So if you're sending data files, you want to make sure they're clearly commented about what's what and uh, make sure that there's nothing sort of ambiguous with your data file. Lots of consultants will actually refuse to send data files. Uh, one thing that usually goes along with data files is a sort of a, a contract that says you're taking on all liability if you do anything with this data because people will tend to manipulate data, make a mistake, go do something, and then blame it on the person who sent them the data. So that's a big legal issue. The scope will almost always be attached to a contract and the scope says what you're going to do, how you're going to do it. The contract says, you know, this is all of the thousand other things that you need to think about as you're doing your project. Uh, but basically anytime you're going to work on anything, you're going to have to sign a contract. And as shown in the Dilbert cartoon, there's so much unnecessary stuff in there and stuff that is really, really hard to understand unless you've read a lot of contracts. So for reference, I, I took a contract course. It, it was a whole week of reading contracts. It was the most soul-sucking week of my life, but it was super important. And now I can sign my own contracts. Uh, but unless you've got that training, I would just either punt it to somebody who's been around a long time and done a lot of contracting or hire a lawyer. That's kind of the way I would put it. And as Dilbert shows here, the lawyer will just make it more complicated, but at least they'll look after you. Okay, so schedule. This is pretty straightforward. There's a couple of different times that we need to be concerned about the schedule. So before the project starts, this is what you're going to want to know. So when will it be completed? That's usually the number one thing that your client or regulator or whoever will want to know. When, when will you be done? But what you want to know for your internal team is when will each task be done? because you want to actually sequence everything. You can't just say, yes, we're going to do this EIA. It's going to take us two months and four days. Uh, you need to look at each task. How long will each take? Do they sequence together? Are there conflicts with personnel? Do we have one person who's supposed to be doing six things at the same time? Um, are there precedents and dependents? So precedents and dependents are tasks that rely upon each other. Um, the precedent uh, a, a dependent depends on a precedent. So once the project has started, you have some different considerations. Uh, your considerations are really, are we on track? Um, is there any slack in the system? If things, you know, the lab took an extra two weeks, we didn't get our data on time, now we're, now we're late. Is there some slack in the system that we can adjust? Um, and then workload. Um, this is a big issue in times of really good economy because people get way over committed and this applies equally with government staff um, when there's a lot of projects on the go all the resources get totally overloaded and you'll be filling out a proposal or starting a new project and everyone will say oh that's great I can't wait to get started on this I'll, I'll be finished my other project in about a month and then, and then I'm all yours. But they actually agreed to start on that day. So that's, that's a really big problem. Um, and that's really just a matter of over-optimism. Um, so the way to deal with that is to actually uh, forecast everybody's workload, uh, not just their workload on this project, but what is your actual workload for the next three months? Are you overcommitted already? And so people should be able to do that for themselves. Uh, estimate how much of their existing workload is already allocated to some other project. Often clients will actually demand to see that in the proposal. How much time is each employee dedicated to this specific project and how much time are they already allocated elsewhere. Um, and then managing field work. I talked about it. I talked a bit about this when I talked about the baseline. Uh, it's really a big logistical operation where project management is really important uh, mainly because of all the travel and the safety issues that go around with that especially traveling out into the middle of nowhere doing a bunch of field work um, usually in places where there's no cell service um, shipping samples is a big issue because 
some types of samples need to be shipped out every day. So if you're flying around for 12 hours a day in a helicopter, you still need to actually ship your samples when you get back to town. So scheduling all this stuff is really important and that's where a good project manager can help a lot because a project manager can look at other resources and if you are the poor person who's been out sampling for 12 hours, it's nice if that project manager has allocated somebody else to grab the samples from you when you get back to town so that you can go get some sleep or whatever. Somebody else can take over the shipping and handling and preserving and all that other stuff that goes along with samples. So getting the right data, it's a big project management exercise to make sure that everything is actually done right. Uh, and that comes down to documentation. There's a whole bunch of other documents that usually go into this that I've, I won't get into today, but things like they're called specific work instructions that tell a field worker exactly, you know, go sample here at this time, at this place, for these parameters and these bottles. It's very specific. And having a good manager get all that stuff done in advance will really make your field work a lot more efficient. And then aligning with seasons. I talked about that with ephemeral phenomena, things that only happen for a couple days every year and you need to be out there at that specific time. So that's really a project management exercise. So I've talked a bit about Gantt charts. Uh, this is actually a Gantt chart from the Mount Poly project. Uh, this was after the dam breach and just for some context. This was uh, an impact assessment for a water discharge for the mine after they had sort of gotten the spilled tailings contained and now water was starting to build up on site and they needed to get a permit to discharge it. And so this is about, I think if I remember correctly, this is about a third of the tasks that went into the environmental impact assessment. I kind of had to slice it down to fit it on this page. And if you look at each one of these lines, each one of these could be its own entire Gantt chart. And so I think I was actually the project manager on this at this time. Yeah, I was. This was so this was 2015. My job was actually to get all the other components to get their stuff done. And so essentially each one of these would be its own Gantt chart done by somebody else. And they had my job was to sort of fit it together. And so if you look at, you know, develop a site-wide model, this is, poor sucker had 10 days to do this. Um, each one of these is, is quite a bit of work. Um, and then it, and it also includes quite different types of work. So this is people doing an assessment. And then there's also people, the water treatment engineers down here trying to figure out what sort of water treatment plant to build including detailed design and so lots of really different stuff fits together uh, but the beauty of this is that it shows kind of that overall sequence so there's a permit amendment going on up here there's an assessment going on here there's water treatment engineers doing their thing down here some more water treatment engineers down here and then doing a bunch of options and alternatives assessments down here and having this Gantt chart allows you to kind of look at all the things that are going on at once and as you go on you can kind of see which of these are they occurring at the right date. I, I cut the date off but across the top would be the dates in, in weeks. And then similarly uh, this was done concurrently so for any uh, discharge permit in BC, you need to do a technical assessment report, which is essentially the EIA. And so again, this is how all the pieces fit into that technical assessment report. So this column is called resources. So this is the initials of the people who are doing it. And again, this allows you to see who's doing what and when and does it all fit together. Um, so I talked about Slack earlier. So this was Rob Miller, actually, coincidentally, Rob Miller was a UBC prof. He left uh, UBC and went to the company I went to. I left that company and went to UBC. So. Anyway, so Rob Miller was working on this. Um, this, is, this is Slack right here, because he needs to finish here, but the information he's producing isn't necessary until here. So basically, so he's doing a, an analysis of mixing zones in a river, and that feeds into the effects assessment, 
but he doesn't really need to be done until here. So this is all slack. So if you're looking at the schedule, oh, so Rob's busy up here. Um, maybe we can move Rob over to here so we're not over, over stressing his team. It, uh, the way it's actually done though is that the person whose initials here is not actually doing the work. That person is kind of overseeing the work and there's a team of people beneath them doing the work. So in this case, it's not a big deal to have overlap. But you can kind of see the critical path. Anywhere, anywhere that there's no slack would be a critical path. And I think in, in MS Project, there's a way to actually show the critical path. I didn't do it here, but uh, I'm not sure if there actually is one here. Basically, anywhere that there's no uh, space in between tasks would be a critical path. OK, so budget. Obviously important. Um, so there's different methods of budgeting. I just have a question. Does there always have to be a critical path? No, okay. there doesn't have to be. There almost always is. Okay. And I'm, I'm just looking at this. The reason there might not be one on here is because this was actually, these are actually part of the same Gantt chart. Okay. And there's a whole bunch more that I'm not showing okay. just because it's huge. And so somewhere in there, there almost certainly is. Uh, but no, there definitely doesn't need to be. Uh, you can have a break in work at some point, and that just means that everybody's got slack, which is nice. It's rare, but it's possible. Um, OK, so budgeting. There's really only two ways of doing this that I'm aware of. Uh, the most common way is essentially just do an estimate of how many people are going to be working for how long. Everybody's got some dollar rate that they charge and you build a budget based on that. The other method is you pull a number out of thin air and you say, we'll do it for this number. And either one is equally accurate, um, or I should say equally inaccurate. Uh, no matter how much effort you go to to come up with a good budget, it will always be off. So unless you're working on something super boring where you've got nothing unexpected happening, then you can do a nice budget. But anything that has any interesting element of sort of we're going to figure things out as we go is going to be extremely difficult to budget. I tend to just like the lump sum because I find the hourly budgeting to be kind of a waste of time and gives you sort of overconfidence in your number, whereas a lump sum at least you know what you can work towards. Uh, lump sum is essentially just one number. Um, I'm going to do this assessment for X dollars. Um, some organizations are totally fine with that. They don't really care. Some want to see how you've done your budget in excruciating detail right down to every hour. And you have spreadsheets and spreadsheets and spreadsheets and an appendix of everybody's hour, uh, which is kind of ridiculous. But whatever. That's what some people want. Um, either way, the budget has to be met, and there's really two things to remember about that is, uh, number one, that most budgets will be broken at some point, um, and the second thing is, is as long as you've notified your client in advance and told them why it's going to be broken, they'll usually uh, issue a uh, change order or a scope change or whatever and give you a higher budget. If you don't notify them, they will tell you to write it off, almost invariably. And then as shown in the Dilbert cartoon here, this is also totally true. There's lots of companies that will actually under budget and then just get scope changes like every month and say, this is out of scope, I need more money. There's some companies that try and just put in one price and never have to issue a scope change. And it totally comes down to whatever the client wants. Some some companies are totally fine with either one, but it's really the most important thing is knowing what, what, which way would the client prefer to do it. Um, okay, so quality. So I said here the quality of a deliverable is the joint responsibility between the project manager and the technical team, and that's definitely true. So the technical, tree, the technical team, generally the scientists or engineers or whoever's working on a project, they're going to be highly driven by their reputation. If you are an environmental scientist, your reputation is absolutely the most valuable thing you have, by far. If you have a bad reputation, you'll never get work. If you have a good reputation, 
you will not even have to look for work. People will come to you. So reputation is absolutely critical. Um, and so technical teams know that if they want to continue getting good work and getting the work they want, uh, they're going to do good work. And most people just have pride in their work. So, I mean, that is great, but it's the project manager's job to sort of harness that um, that will to do a good job and to actually make them do a good job. Because a lot of times a scientist will think they're doing a good job, but that's only because they didn't realize that they've missed five things along the way. Um, so the PM is driven by the contract. Whatever is in the contract is the project manager's job to make sure that is actually delivered at the end of the day. And the way to do that is to have a quality assurance plan. So a quality assurance plan is a document, usually a document, or it can be, can be a checklist, but usually it's a document that specifies everything about the project that the technical teams need to do to ensure high quality. And it's usually, um, it's usually a checklist. Um, I've got a bunch of examples coming up. And so there can be checklists for calculations, there can be checklists for models, there can be checklists for documentation, there can be checklists for anything. Um, they're super useful because it's almost impossible to keep track of the thousand things that you need to do to make sure your project actually meets high quality. A big component of this though is senior review. So no matter where you work, um, I would try and make sure that you get your work senior reviewed very regularly. Most companies, but not all, have it as an absolute requirement that absolutely anything that leaves your office gets senior reviewed. And I remember as a junior scientist thinking that's really over the top and unnecessary. Uh, but after working in that field for not too long, I realized that the senior review actually helps you get lots of feedback on your work and it helps you improve a lot if if you have a good senior reviewer uh, but it also helps you protect yourself from making silly opinions and all sorts of things so senior review is really important what i would say is if you go work for a company that doesn't have a strict senior review policy i would be a little bit nervous um, and then consistency that's part of both the checklist and the senior review and everything so there's a couple different types of consistency that you need to be concerned about. So if you're working on an EIA, um, say you're looking at the um, health effects of eating vegetation downwind of an incinerator, um, you'd want to make sure that the air quality team and the vegetation team and the wildlife team are all looking at the same sort of conceptual model. So. Sometimes in an EIA, somebody will do an air quality assessment, but they haven't actually predicted exactly what will land where. They'll just predict the ambient air quality, but they haven't predicted deposition. So then you can't understand what the health effects on vegetation might be. Or maybe the wildlife team has chosen a few species that are really important to local stakeholders, uh, but they're not actually the ones that are eating the vegetation and bioaccumulating substances so anyway so consistency is a huge issue in a multidisciplinary uh, project you need to make sure that you're all sort of looking at the same uh, same biological receptors the same chemical inputs the same sort of habitat disturbances all of that needs to be really common and consistent but the other side of consistency is around your approach and the biggest area where that can be a problem is around how you find significance because pretty much every technical discipline will have a slightly different idea about what is a significant adverse effect and the end game for every environmental impact assessment is helping the decision makers determine are there significant adverse impacts and so if you have 15 different technical disciplines they all have a slightly different approach to what uh, to how they determine significance it's going to be kind of a mess in the end. So you really need to be consistent around um, finding significance, which we will be talking about later in this term, by the way. Okay, and then, so style sheets. Most companies have style sheets, uh, which kind of just enforce some writing rules. Uh, 
And this is one of those things where it doesn't really matter which sort of formatting and term terminology and style that you use for writing as long as it's consistent within a given document. So here's a few examples. This is for calculations. Um, and so this, I think, is the full sheet. But essentially, you want to lay out who's doing the work, what's the purpose or the objective, what are your assumptions. Assumptions are huge, uh, particularly um, in, in doing calculations and models. Some formulas are only valid under certain conditions. And if so, you want to be explicit about what your assumptions are around those conditions. Um, so I'll just show, for example, Stokes' law, um, settling the particles. We assume that the particle is perfectly spherical. Even though we know it's not, that's our assumption so that we can use this formula. Um, and then there's a lot of little kind of nitpicky stuff here, all of which is very important. A good one here is units. Uh, often there's a unit conversion that needs to be done, and if it's not sort of clearly laid out, people can get lost and make errors. Um, definition sketch, so you sort of laid out a sketch of what you're sort of trying to calculate. It doesn't matter if it's a model or a simple calculation. You always want to sort of sketch it out so the person can visualize what it is. Uh, input data, what are, what are all the input data? And so again, this checklist can be applied to virtually any sort of deliverable, as long as the reviewer can actually find that that information exists. It doesn't matter if your sketch is a beautiful CAD drawing or just a hand sketch, you just have to have a sketch. And so that's the purpose of a checklist is, you know, it's, it's either been done or not. So they're very simple and I think they're extremely valuable because they're really good at catching little errors that you might not have thought to go back and double check. So this is one from an air quality model. This is extremely specific, but um, you know, this, this is kind of some of the inputs that go into the model, and this allows the, uh, the modeler to go in and actually initial. And by the way, having somebody initial or sign these things actually makes a huge difference in terms of, that, in terms of people, number one, following it, but number two, taking it really seriously. Because if you're a professional anything, and you sign a document, you're really putting your entire career on the line if you've not gone in and done a good job of checking it. So any, any one of these needs to be signed and dated and people need to be accountable. But uh, that's just another example. Here's one from a water quality model. Essentially just check all of these things, understand the big picture, draw a conceptual model. What are you modeling and why are you modeling it? Even things like that, that you can easily do a model without going through those steps, but you just want to go through and check, yeah, I've done that, yeah, I've done that. Does that make sense? It's just basically something to make you step back and double check that what you're doing actually makes sense. So this one is for senior review. So this is essentially, this is for writing. Uh, a big one is acronyms. People use lots of acronyms in, in reports and there's certain ways that you want to do it more concisely rather than um, sort of inconsistently, which tends to happen when you have lots of authors working on the same document. This is a funny one, if you're using a report from the previous year as a template, do a global check and catch all the references to that previous year, or the previous client, or the previous whatever that you copied and pasted that from. Reference checks can be a real pain in an EIA, because you've got uh, usually pages and pages and pages of references, and somebody goes and makes an edit, removes one of them, um, and it screws up your whole list. So that's where reference manager or citation manager software comes in handy. But anyway, so all of these things, they're, they're just checklists. They're just to make you sort of double check that you've done things properly. And here's a super detailed one. This is from a groundwater model uh, checklist. It's 18 pages long. Um, the guy who wrote this is obviously very detailed. Uh, but even, you know, the first two pages don't even get beyond conceptualization. And then there's like a thousand lines of did you check this variable and did you check this against field data and did you calibrate this? And So they really vary, but 
you know, it's kind of fit for purpose. Next topic, and one of the last ones, is communication. So on any large uh, multidisciplinary project, particularly one that has uh, regulatory implications, in other words, uh, a major, you know, multi-billion dollar project can either get approved or rejected based on what your EIA looks like. Um, a lot of companies have really tightly constrained communications. And so the most constrained, uh, I've worked on a few projects like this. There's a single project manager from the consultant and there's a single person from the client and only those two speak to together. Nobody else ever communicates without going through those two. And so there's pros and cons of that. The con obviously is that they become a bottleneck. If either one of those two people decides to go on vacation, everything grinds to a halt. Um, but the benefit of that is that things don't get lost. So you've got one person on each end making sure all the information is tracked. And if somebody commits to doing something, that person is tracking it. If somebody sends some data, that person is filing it. And so it is good in that regard. In practice, most, most projects are sort of run as a hybrid. Most important conversations, anything that involves scope, schedule, and budget should be communicated between those two people. Uh, but anything that's technical, you know, did, do you have some data I can use, that sort of thing, uh, normally you would have those conversations with the technical person on the other side and then just inform the PM after. Um, a couple of things here that I wrote that are fairly obvious but tend to happen too much anyway. So in any kind of professional email, avoid jokes, memes, sarcasm, whatever. None of that stuff uh, comes through clearly later. And it's not so much the person who's receiving your email who might get your joke. Uh, it's the person they accidentally forward it to or if you get subpoenaed because some of these things do end up being legal uh, cases, then they will just take all your email and they can, you know, lawyers will then use that to show that you're not a serious person. So I would just avoid that 100% in, in any company email. Um, and so I set up above, nearly every communication of substance in environmental science can wind up as evidence. So if you're doing environmental science, chances are there is some legal aspect to it. Uh, if you're doing an EIA, something needs to get approved. That can all become part of a legal record. If you're cleaning up a spill, obviously there's going to be lawsuits. Any of this stuff can end up having your email subpoenaed. Now it's rare, that doesn't happen very often, uh, but it has happened uh, enough to kind of make me realize that uh, this, all this stuff should just be avoided. If you want to send your client a joke, send it from your personal email. Um, so then verbal communication, this is really key. Uh, no matter how much you trust somebody, you can't trust your collective memories. Um, I can have, I can work for my best friend and we can agree to something. And two weeks later, I will call him up and say, where's that file you promised to send me? And he will go, oh, really? Did I promise you to send me? So any, anything that you agree to verbally, if it has some sort of an action attached to it or commitment, follow up by email immediately after and just say, as discussed, don't forget to send me that file. Or as discussed, you're increasing my budget by $10,000. It doesn't matter if it has any importance whatsoever and it, you've discussed it verbally, follow up by email. And the other thing is, is that people will change roles. Uh, often a lot of um, kind of technical and management work that goes on is done by people who know each other and trust each other, but uh, everybody at some point moves on in their career, moves roles, changes companies. And if you've got verbal agreements with somebody at another company, that is completely worthless when that person leaves. And pretty much nobody would ever honor a verbal agreement done by two other people uh, just because one person swears it's true. So always follow up by email at a minimum to document any decision or commitment or action. And then a big thing in an EIA is team-wide email. Uh, often there's well over 100 people working on an EIA. And the question is, do you 
email everybody? Do you email just the leads? Um, it really is a personal preference, but what I would say is two things. Keep it very brief or nobody will read it, um, but also use cloud-based software. So if you need to get some communication out to people, put a copy of the important emails on a SharePoint or something so that people hopefully will be able to access it after they've cleaned out their inbox or whatever. So keep a permanent record. So tracking. So once the project is going, there's a few things that you want to track. It's not just progress, but along the way, um, team members will come up with all sorts of action items. So an action item is usually some, some um, follow-up action that somebody's going to take after agreeing to it in a meeting. Uh, my favorite kind is the kind where you give somebody an action item who wasn't in the meeting and you let them know afterwards that they have an action item. People love that. Um, but just make sure it's well documented and by well documented it should have a name and a deadline. Any action item that doesn't have a name and a deadline will never get done. Um, nobody will do an action item that doesn't have their name on it. That's just a fact of life. So you need to actually make somebody accountable for any sort of commitment. And action items can be really small. It can be like you're going to phone somebody and double check that they have this data set. It can be really huge, like you're going to develop a model and understand sediment quality. Like it can be anything. Basically, there's no, uh, no rule on how big it is, but essentially it's just something that one person is responsible for doing at a certain time. So workflow, so tr tracking tasks as they're completed. I mentioned earlier that uh, with any Gantt chart, you can do a baseline. And so say I had done this on uh, May 9th. This was May 9th, 2015. I remember the day very clearly. And this was nine weeks later to the day. Um, as we go, uh, you'll see this uh, timeline changing. You can set this as a baseline. You can still modify this Gantt chart as you go as things get added or subtracted. But you want to know where you are along the way at any given time. You should know which tasks have been completed, which information has flown from one component to, an, to the next. And these arrows usually show information flow. And so if you're halfway through the project and you want to check up on things, anything that has ended should actually be done. So you can call all the people and just get them to verify that their information has been sent. Uh, but it's really important to be tracking that as you go, otherwise things will invariably get lost. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about filing, uh, not too much. So anything that you need to track, action items, whatever, data, information flow, everything needs to be filed. And there's lots of different ways of filing information. Uh, but I will say that it's not really straightforward because it's difficult to come up with a filing system that works for lots of different people. Um, I, for one, am terrible at this. Um, I hired somebody from my company to do all my filing for me because otherwise I know that everything's going to end up in a mess. But the main rule is just you need to have one filing system that works. And by filing system, I mean do you file it based on the type of information or the component or, you know, there, there's kind of that flow down of folder structures that needs to be pretty logical. Uh, one way to do it is to f set up a file structure that follows your work breakdown structure uh, with basically a file folder for every task in your uh, work breakdown structure. There's lots of different ways of doing it, but again, just pick one, use it, and enforce it. Um, project filing can be a nightmare if people aren't following sort of a really rigid uh, set of rules because people will just put files all over the place. And again, in a large project like this with 100 people working over that six months or a year that you've been working on it, you'll have staff turnover, you'll have people forget where they put stuff. You'll just, anyway, I'll just say it's really important and pick a system and use it. Now, one thing that I really like is for tracking budget. This is, this is for tracking budget and time. And so there's two different types of graph shown here. Um, first one's called a burn down. You can actually do this with time or budget. Essentially, if, if you were doing it with budget, you would start with your total budget and you would 
have this graph go down as your budget gets spent, which would be the opposite of this. But this one is done with time. So in this example, this project has 20 days to be completed, and it's just assumed a linear completion, so 1 20th of the project gets completed every day. Red light shows the actual progress, and what this assumes is that you can somehow re come up with an estimate of how percent of what percent you are complete, which is extremely difficult. Um, because, again, the 80 20 rule, 80% of the work is done in the last 20% of the time, or however you want to phrase it, but often most of the work gets done in a very tight, compressed timeline at the end. Um, so, this is okay, but it really comes down to how well you can estimate how complete you are. But the benefit of this is you can see if you're ahead of or behind schedule pretty clearly by making this estimate. And even if your estimate's off by a little bit, typically it'll still show you what you need to see. And then a similar one is your budget tracking. So the budget tracking is usually not linear. Most budgets do not get spent linearly. So you've got a total budget, in this case it's $700,000, and you can see that they had planned to not do a lot of work in January, they get ramped up in February to November, and then in December they're not doing a whole lot, maybe the word processor's cleaning up the document that everybody else worked on, and maybe in the first month the project managers are just sort of getting all the resources ready to roll, trying to get the data to roll in. And so what I like about these is they're non-linear, they're a lot more realistic in terms of what you can, you can plan for when you're gonna spend what and when. And then the green line is showing what is actually being spent. And again, the, the, the dollar being spent is a proxy for how much work is actually being done. So if you are halfway through the year and you've only spent $100,000, but your estimate says you should have spent $350,000, chances are extremely high that you're way behind um, and you're not going to get your job done on time. Either that or people are just super efficient, which is possible but unlikely. And then conversely, if you're, if you're up here, you're in the middle of June and you've spent $600,000, you're probably going to go way over budget. Uh, but that's where it's nice to have both of these going at the same time. Because if you look at this and you're way over budget for where you're supposed to be, but you're also 90% complete, then maybe things aren't so bad. Um, but I think I wrote on here, good for team, great for client. So they're really good for managing your team. Clients really like to see them because they like to have a quick update on how, how far you've progressed, how much money you've spent, are you sort of on target. Um, but I, I like them mainly for being able to manage teams, particularly the one, the one on the bottom, because if a team has not spent any money, that means they're not working. So. That's kind of an indicator. All right, I hope you learned something about project management today. And one of the other things that I wanted to mention was that you will hear the odd question that was asked last year. If you have questions, uh, because we're not in a real time uh, setting, there's a couple of different ways you can ask me questions. One is you can send me an email about a lecture. And if it's something that I think would be applicable to the whole lecture that other people would want to hear, I might record a quick follow-up Q&A and then post it to Canvas. Or you can ask me during labs um, if it's something that's more of a hands-on how-to type question. So keep in mind, we do have those avenues of communication and I'm hoping to be as interactive as we possibly can throughout this remote term. Okay, see you in the lab.